Okay, hello everyone. It's me, Rain Wilson. And it's me, Reza Aslan, and this is Metaphysical Milkshake. And Reza, today we're going to do a podcast a little bit different. You mean like no pants? No, I already did that on our Dr. Jeff Sachs interview. Today, uh, we'll be having an open and honest conversation with one of the greatest singer-songwriters of the last few decades, the one and the only Ben Folds. Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake, the show where we go deep, we get weird, and we search for the meaning of life along the way. Presented by Cass Media and Soul Pancake. She's a brick and I'm drowning slowly. I'm so excited about this. I have so many questions for him about music, about creativity, inspiration. I am the biggest Ben Folds fan ever. I'm so excited to be talking to one of my musical heroes. Ben, uh, for those who don't know, is the host of Lightning Bugs with Ben Folds, a podcast that celebrates with some of the world's foremost creatives about their endlessly various artistic processes. Well, actually, he's also a New York Times bestselling author. He wrote a book also called Lightning Bugs, smart. And, you know, I think it's no exaggeration to say that Ben Folds is one of the major artistic influencers of his generation. And not only that, but we will be guesting on a bonus episode of Lightning Bugs as well, which is also out today. And the three of us come up with a song together. No spoilers, but it it has a little to do with poop. But beautiful poop. Yeah, Reza. no, exactly. Yes, I mean, Uplifting. it's a beautiful song. So head over to Lightning Bugs with Ben Folds on his feed to listen to the episode and follow, rate, and review if you like it. Ben welcomes amazing guests each week to break down creativity, including Bishop Briggs, Sarah Bareilles, William Shatner. Ho oh, ho, want to find out about that and many, many more. Wow, what a thrill this is. The great Ben Folds is here on my Zoom screen. So So nice to see you, Ben. Very nice to see you guys, too. Let me tell you something. If you told my high school self that one day you were going to be talking to Ben Folds, that high school self would have peed his pants. I thought you were going to say the high school self would have said, who? (laughs) (laughs) Who's who's now? Conversely, the the post-college grad Rain Wilson, if he was told that he was going to be talking to Ben Folds, would be seriously thrilled. And I just want to say with with all uh, sincerity, I had a cassette tape in my van. I was a man with a van in New York City. I was moving people's futons. And I had a cassette with your first two albums on either side. And I would just flip it back and forth them pop in occasionally I'd pop in a Wilco or 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 something else but uh those albums brought me great joy and uh through like every kind of nerdy white kid in the 90s and early thousands so um thank you so much for that thank you that means a lot that's awesome thank yeah it, it really and I I just loved all those songs they're just in that in that sweet spot of when Mm -hmm. you're in your kind of like your early 20s and music is part of your life and it's the soundtrack to your life. And when you're driving and you're popping in a a song, it's like, oh, my my life has has come alive. It's like I'm in a movie. I'm in a two minute, 37 second movie. Music is so big. Yeah, so big for you when you're that age, isn't it? It's kind of, I call it uh, pop music, you know, music for the mating age. Oh, yeah. I would just like sit in my car and listen to a song just so I could weep. You wow. know what I mean? Like Dwight Schrute w- did with Everybody Hurts on The Office. You remember that <laughs> yes, episode? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or I would just like sit, you know, I would listen to, to all those songs about longing. I was, a, you know, I didn't have a lot of <clears throat> girlfriends. I guess you could say. So, <laughs> or friends. A lot. Or, I would just, I would <laughs> or just any listen friends. to music. Or people that I would talk to you. <laughs> no, but you know, what's funny, Ben, you, from what I understand, like you always wanted to be a musician, right? I mean, you've been listening to music since what? You were like two years old? <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was just seemed to be really super interested and obsessed with it when I was, when I was two years old. Yeah. That's crazy. And you're doing so many exciting things, uh, and it's so great to see this other chapter of your life. But mm. just going back a little bit, do you ever want to rock again? Do you ever just want to, like, rock out with your cock out a little bit? Well, maybe keep the cock in. I do. I do. And and, and sometimes I actually do it, do it all, the, the, the rock, the cock, the whole thing. It does happen. I play with symphony orchestras a lot, and, and um, 
that, that always goes down really well with the orchestra, the, the moment you whip, whip it all out. In getting to uh, read about you a little bit and um, get to know your life and your wonderful uh, podcast, one of the things I was really struck with, because I have a similar story, was the incredible failure that you undertook mm. in terms of trying to get into the University of Miami Music School mm. or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> and you got rejected by them and you you were a percussionist and then you took your drum kit and threw it in a lake or something like that. Yeah. And yeah, I guess I'm really intrigued by that. I, I, and I, I always zero in on, on people's stories when they've had a failure that feels like their life is over. It feels like the book is closed and yet what that did and what that fueled, thank God you're not a percussionist. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Thank God you're yeah. not in like the Orlando Symphony playing timpani right now. <laughs> uh, nothing against the timpanist at the Orlando Symphony. It's a lot of counting. It's a lot of counting playing timpani. It's true. Did you ever play an orchestra, Reza? I did. I was a percussionist. And, uh, How about that? 90% just counting and then boom, boom. Not as bad as the triangle player, though. That's <laughs> that's true. That's, that's the like, counting. And the worst is missing it because it's like 93 bars, 92 Anything. Oh. oh, oh, shit! I'm curious about this too. What what part has failure played in your success as a musician? And I think, and y'all probably know this too. You have to fail it for nothing else to realize you're still here. It's okay. You know, it's a yeah. scary thing to do to uh, fail of it. I can think of, you know, certain shows that there's nothing really romantic about the story of the show except that I walked away very certain that that was it. Like, that's just the worst. And I can't imagine bombing so badly uh, as a comedian. Like, if you just add that they didn't laugh, it's bad enough that they talk over your material, but they didn't <laughs> laugh. That would, that, would, that would sound like failure that if you, once you endure that on a regular basis, you realize the other side of it. Oh, okay. Well, I try a thing. I fail. Okay. Mm. I'm not dead. It's fine. The next one, I'll try something else or I'll try it again. Maybe it actually works. And I did the same thing two nights in a row. The, the, the drum thing was horrible because I went home and I worked at a, uh, went, you know, went back to North Carolina. I worked as a, a you know, a, ba a bag boy at a grocery store for a long time, just thinking that that's it. My life is now I'm a bag boy because I flunked out of the University of Miami. I got in a fight. Guy beat me up threw my drums in the lake. I had a scholarship, actually. They let me in on a scholarship, and I lost that and got kicked out. Mm. You know, I, it's funny because I remember having a conversation with Jason Sudeikis way back in the day, and his dream was to be a member of Blue Man Group. He was doing improv in Las Vegas, and every year he would warm up and he would try out for a Blue Man Group. And he'd work <sighs> on his drum skills and walking like a blue man and... And every year he kept getting rejected by Blue Man. He's like, oh, God damn it, motherfucker. I just want to be a goddamn Blue Man. And so then he's like, well, I'll move to New York City and I'll start writing comedy. And then he got on to Saturday Night Live as a writer and then a performer. And then the rest is history. Um, but thank God you're not a percussionist. Thank God Jason Sudeikis is not a Blue Man. Yeah, you know, he he helped me move my piano one time uh, when uh, when he was at KU when he was in in, uh, in college. I think the other the other uh, aspect of failure that I just wanted to touch on is you know for for me uh, uh, I won't do the long I'll do the super short version of the story. But I got cast in my first Broadway play uh, a couple wow. years out of acting school, and I sucked. And to me, it was it created all this pressure. I really thought like I was going to get a Tony Award and a New York Times review and get signed at the William Morris Agency. And I had all this pressure on me and I was terrible. Mm. And it, it it caused like a series of almost like cathartic nervous breakdowns of like the, the snotty crying of the, <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> but basically through that catharsis, um, I really embraced who I was as an actor, which is I'm quirky and I'm weird and I have my own way of doing things and fuck them, fuck the man. And I'm not going right. to like do it for someone else. I'm going to do it for mm -hmm. me. And I always say that when I tell the long version of that story that I never would have played Dwight Schrute had I not failed at my first Broadway gig. So uh, how, does the, how does that pain of failure kind of fuel transformation? 
Well, I think that maybe what 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 someone who hadn't been through it would maybe focus on would be more of uh, uh, working through the pain of it. To me, it's more um, it's more about the post the post death experience, realizing that that's not really death. It gives you a freedom. For instance, mm. I, I I had a long term failure in almost my entire twenties. The same songs that were on side A of your cassette tape, our first album. I walked around with those songs from the time I was like 19 or 20 years old mm-hmm. through to when I was about 27. And I was rejected for that whole time. And at the end of it, I just decided, you know what? Fuck it. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not kissing anyone else's ass. I'm not making another demo tape. If you want my music, you can buy it. So if I played a show and a record company said, you know, uh, we'd like uh uh, could you give us a tape? I was like, nah, I don't really do that. You can buy it as music, and otherwise, I'm not interested in being on a label. I really meant that, and the, and and just knowing I could go it alone, and knowing that the there was no uh, safety net. Like if you're mm. if you think you're auditioning for the man, and and they are going to guide your career, you're not going to say or do what you mean. But as soon as they're out of the way, and you realize, wait a minute, there's no approval system here. I have to make music that works. For those 20 people, that's all that matters. And if that means I'm going to just do something ridiculous, that's fine. But when you're auditioning, you want to show your date manners, like you want to be polite. And I think that that was a big thing for me as I was no longer polite about anything, did actually give no shit at that point because Mm. I knew I'd failed. I was done. I was. I, I had already that. failed. You can't cancel yeah. me. I'm canceled. Yeah. It's giving That's zero great. shits and all the doors zero. that are, that opens. That's amazing. That, and isn't it weird because you kind of feel like it's like being uh, aloof with the universe. Listen, this is all a very fascinating conversation. As someone who has no real experience with failure, I'm fascinated by what you guys are talking about. Here. <laughs> you know, the other thing that I'm really fascinated by, Ben, is. I love that, you know, you're an incredibly creative and artistic person. It's just that most people know you for, I don't know, like the primary way in which your, you know, artistic Mm. nature and your creativity has expressed itself, which is music. Uh, But you're also a writer. You're a photographer. In fact, you've had photos published in National Geographic, which is a big deal. People don't, I don't know if people understand. That's a big fucking deal. Uh, Mm. I'm just curious, like... How do all these different art forms kind of work for you? Do they, do, do you use different parts of your brain, you know, when you're mm. writing or when you're playing music or when you're, you know, doing photography or is it just sort of different platforms for the same sentiment, the same expression? I, I, I think for someone like, and this is probably true of, of, of you guys too, uh, you know, you, you can have interest in other things. And I love photography. And I spent so much time in dark rooms printing my stuff, mm-hmm. uh, uh, photographing. I, I spent as much time sometimes doing that or more than I have in the studio. But for some reason, as soon as I make music, I'm very well aware that I have a voice for it. Like, mm-hmm. like there's something, and it probably comes from a little bit of that failure we're talking about, a little, a little bit of the uh, out of the shits to give, is that I, I don't, I look, this is what I do, and take it or whatever. That's mm-hmm. what I do, and I know that it is what it is. When it comes to photography, I'm always trying to please. You know, I'm always worried. Is that cropped right? Can I stick that in there? Would so and so have done that? Is the contrast right? Should I have a darker black? Like all these things, I worry about because I think that they're correct answers and they're incorrect answers. And I realize humbly because of that, I will never have a voice as a photographer. I'm pretty good at it, but I won't have a voice at it. I may not be as good at music as I think I am, or as other people think I am. But I'm quite confident that what I, I'm doing is what I intended to do, you know? And um, I see people who are great, some are really great, that struggle with that sense of delusion, that what they do is for some reason worth putting out there or is unique in some kind of way. I, for some reason, don't understand that I shouldn't be doing it, and I just do it. I don't even know about the disciplines helping each other. Like, I'm not sure that, like, my composition in music helps my composition in uh, in photography or in writing. I, I, I'm not aware if that's the case. I just know that I'm very comfortable in one art form and the others I can try as I may, and it makes me appreciate. Another thing is people talk in shop. 
You know, I used to be a real bitch about that. Someone wants to talk about little music shit, like the microphones, the number of the microphone and stuff. And (laughs) I'm like, kid, that's not why you make music. It's in your hands. And and I love talking about that shit when it comes to uh, to lenses. Like, well, I really love my thirty five millimeter lens with a one point four in, and I love that. <laughs> and I realize because I love that so much, why should I steal someone else's joy if they want to talk about the action on on a piano or something? Like, I should appreciate that. So it made me nicer. Look, you all know there's just so much going on in the world right now, whether it's stuff you're excited about, like the long-planned office reunion that will never be made, (laughs) or the stuff you'd rather not think about, like the long-planned office reunion that uh, is never going to be made. You can't control the vibes out there, people, but you can always control the vibes in your head with a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds in your ears. Have you tried these, Rain? I have. They're fantastic. I go running with them. Whether you use them to pump up, wind down, work, or work out, Raycons are the go-to for the -the on-the-go audio. And every new everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. You get three new sound profiles to make sure that everything you're listening to sounds its best with just the right amount of bass. Raycons offer eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. There's also this built-in mic so you can take your calls on your earbuds at the press of a button. And Raycons start at half the price of other premium audio brands, but they sound just as good. So right now, Metaphysical Milkshake listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash milkshake. That's buy, B-U-Y, R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash milkshake to save 15% on Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash milkshake. Folks, the seasons, they are a-changing, and so will your personal taste. Are you ready for something new, folks? Freshen up your fall with a change in decor, all while upgrading your comfort. That's where Brooklinen comes in. Brooklinen was started to create beautiful, high-quality home essentials that don't cost an arm and a leg. And people, what a success. Brooklinen works directly with manufacturers to make luxury available directly to you without the luxury level markups. You know what I'm talking about. So get their amazing array of products at a reasonable price. Brooklinen has something for your every comfort need. I literally woke up this morning in Brooklinen sheets. And I'm talking buttery, soft, breathable sheets. They also have plush and absorbent towels, cozy robes, comfy loungewear that you'll want to put on and never take off. In fact, Brooklinen is so confident in their core products that they come with a 365-day warranty. And listen, I'm a fan, and I can tell you, fans are confident about these sheets. They've received over 75,000 five-star reviews and counting So give yourself the comfort refresh you deserve and get it for less at Brooklinen. All you got to do is go to brooklinen.com and use the promo code MILKSHAKE to get $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. bucks. thats B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, brooklinen.com. Don't forget to enter the promo code MILKSHAKE to get $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's brooklinen.com, promo code milkshake. One of the quotes I was struck with from your book is this idea of luminosity and Mm. artists pursuing luminosity. And that's very funny because actually I just recently changed my Twitter bio to uh, something like something very metaphysical milkshakey. Like I'm going to misquote my own Twitter bio, but it's like (laughs) yet just another luminous being, um, having a, a a spiritual experience in a, in a human body or something like that. But so I, I love that word luminous, but, but that might yeah. be something that connects both of these arts uh, from your personal expression and uh, connects all artists is, is that what we're ultimately striving for? Uh, I love that phrase striving for luminosity. What does that mean to you? I use the the um, the the metaphor of uh, of lightning bugs uh, because it is they are luminous, but it doesn't last for long. Mm. You know, it's like they light up, and then you're like, "Where to go? Where to go?" And that's the way I feel about making things. Is like it lights up, and you're like, "I got the where to go." Where to go? Yeah, and, that's and, like that's sorry to interrupt, but that's like me with the office. Nine years lit up on the office, and after that, like where the 
My life has been a fucking shit show. You know, you were lit up, what and the then hell? and then you where to go? Half of the battle then as an artist is is hanging on to it, finding it. It's one thing to be inspired, and we can all be inspired, but then you gotta have to do a lot of work to to if you want to put it in a bottle, you want to put your lightning bug in a jar and carry the luminosity around. You have to have the skill to go hunt it down, put it in the jar, and not kill mm. the poor little motherfucker. And then, you know, you've got a, a lightning bug in the jar. And and I, I do think that like light is a great, you know, uh is is a great part of that uh metaphor. Also in the day, you don't see the lightning bugs. And I like the day as as a metaphor for awareness of technique, and uh, awareness of 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 the of your mind being on. And and this is why I couldn't do what you guys do at at, at all, because I choke real easy, and um, I I feel like my light comes on, like my I get my head. You choke really easy. I saw the video that has five million views with you lead creating a song with an orchestra in ten minutes, uh, yeah. effortlessly <laughs> yeah. with pure yeah. <laughs> pure creativity. There was zero chokage going on there. What are you talking? How do you talk talk to me about that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. You've got a point. I can do that. Uh, and I guess it's back to music again. But like, I did a TV show for five years on NBC. It was a singing show called Sing Off. Yeah. And every time they would put it either a cue card or say, "Will you say this?" or I had to be ready. It's like five, four, three. Okay. Uh, uh, like I just like I would just <laughs> freeze up and and couldn't do because I would get in my head. It's like, what does this look sound like? Should I slow down? Is my southern accent too much? Like I just I, I had a hard time with it. What I love about luminosity is. Um, the spiritual teacher Abdul Baha has a quote that says, "We must become light incarnate." And I think mm. there is, we can see, we can feel this. Okay, this isn't a yeah. scientific thing, but every mm. person you meet has a certain light, right? You you can see the light in them. It doesn't matter what they do; they can be an accountant and they can have a light. So we all have a light to give to the world. We have a light inside of us, and we can give that light to the world. Absolutely, and we do yeah. it in different ways. And Artists do it through making music or playing characters or whatever. And Reza does it by writing, you know, academic abstracts in publications that no one reads. And also making love. We all have our ways of shedding that light onto the world. No, no, no. That's well stated. Because I think a lot of people um, uh, worry about numbers uh, and 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 eyeballs and stuff. And, um, and I think the reason that what you said really works is because I think that we've all made stuff that people didn't see. Uh, and I took it really seriously. I'm still proud of it. Still do it. No one heard it. No one saw it. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and it, I can see how you, people might feel, let's say that your day gig is something, I, an accountant, and then you make beautiful music at night. You know, the, the, uh, the composer, uh, Charles Ives, uh, he, he was an insurance man. He ran insurance business, uh, uh, turn of the 20th century. And at night he just wrote music. Um, uh, turns out to be, he's one of the most innovative 20th century, uh, composers looking back, uh, in, in American history. And, uh, he was doing it at night, but no one was listening to it at all. And, uh, and I think it's important to tell people what you just said, like there's light coming from what you do. You're emanating that. And there's no one else that's doing it like you, if you're being true true to yourself. The other thing that I like about the metaphor of using, you know, luminosity is the, the, the pursuit of creativity is that uh, it works really well when you think about collaboration as well, right? Two lights coming together, make a, a brighter mm -hmm. light. And you've collaborated obviously with, you know, a whole host of different artists and all of this, I should now admit is some, nothing more than a transition to talking about William Shatner. What's William Shatner like? Oh, uh, <laughs> no, nah, I love that guy, man. I have known him. He did a thing for me. Um, I actually, I, I, I wrote a song for him in high school, kind of finished it in my first year of, of college. And I, I intended for Shatner to do this. And I, I, I looked up his agent in the library. Oh my god! And I mailed it, and I got a form letter back. And here's what and it sounded years, like. like: She's a brick, and I'm drowning slowly. Exactly. <laughs> the, once he does it that way, the next time it's completely it's different. And so I didn't think about it for years. And then, as soon as we had a hit, 
my first thought was, well, I want to make an experimental record because I know no one's going to give me money to do this as soon as we're not famous anymore. So I want to do that, and I'd love to have Shatner do that song. And so I got, you know, kind of got that song together, and we sent, you know, a note over to him, and we had a, a top five hit. And so he was into it, and he said he'd show up and do it. And he was on his way to the studio, and I realized the song sucked. It was like <laughs> I just really looked at the song. I was like, this is just so bad. And so I totally rewrote it. I I I made it a whole new song kind of put down a piano part and he spoke over. And that was like 1997, such a long time ago. But he was awesome then. Uh, his friend told me, um, uh, you know, Bill spits, he chews out and he chews and spits out directors and direction. You will not direct Bill Shatner. Just take my word for it. And I did. Like I told, I always, that wasn't good. And that's great. And can you do it again? And we had that relationship. I ended up producing his record, I, I I gave him shit the whole time, and he loved it. He was awesome. He did things <laughs> so unusually. He never does it the same uh, twice. At the very end, I I given him a little too much, and he said, "Benny, you're pecking me like a chicken." And I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm gonna I'm gonna toot my own horn for a second. So my wife and I have a nonprofit in Haiti that does arts education for girls, um, and. I have firsthand seen the ability of the arts to transform people and also to transform community, to help build community. And you are one of the few artists out there on the front lines kind of championing kind of state-sponsored art support, political art support and funding in the schools and in the communities. And... Uh, you know, God bless you for that. That is a conversation that used to be really big. And like, we were always talking about that in the 80s and 90s, like, oh, arts funding, arts. Nowadays, there's so much shit. The world's about to blow up. No one really talks about arts funding, but it's yeah. it's so important. What's your take on that? What's your mission on that? I know you were meeting with a lot of politicians and are you still active yeah. in that movement? I am, yeah, because I really think, you know, it's like, yeah, I got to pick up a shovel at some point and chip in and you can't do everything, you know? And uh, I think that has been my thing because I feel like, I, I, I feel like let's just, if, if we're gonna buy into the idea that we're just going off the cliff and, and humanity's just, just, lost, just lost it, that the best restart will be growing great minds. Like, okay, we've shit the bed. So sorry. At least, at least, at least, give the kids an education. And you don't have a great education without solid arts in the education. You just don't. That's that's. You could support that with with data, dropout data, and anecdotal uh, uh, testimony for years and years and years. All the politicians know it. All the parents know it. The teachers know it. So I think the thing to do is is is, is to make sure that the government invests strongly in, uh, in music education, arts education uh, across the board because you can do it privately, and you should. You should donate to things and do these things privately. But it takes an operation as big as the government to reach everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, uh, 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 people are just picking and choosing. You, you you have to hit all the area codes and all the zip codes, and it's very important to have the data to do that. I think it's also important because symbolically, if your government that you elected that are the that is the representation of all of us together, if our collective idea is that spending on one of the most important things for a childhood is so small that it can't be measured. What does that say about the whole symbolism of it? Mm. What does that say about us? This is what's so important. Here's the, here's the stack that we're spending on other shit, and you can't even measure. One little way of showing how little we spend on the arts altogether in the federal government is to say that if we're spending equally for the entire year, and it's like something like seven million a minute, I can't remember how much it is, but it's a lot like per, per minute or per 20. 20 minutes go by, and we spent on the NEA, uh, 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 PBS, uh, the Kennedy Center, all, the, all the things that yeah. we spent. That goes down in 20 minutes. We're done. The rest of the year, spending equally around the clock for the entire rest of the year, 
you never touch the arts again. It's 20 minutes on the year. That is that tells me that that people don't care about it. And 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 what I find when I go out in the real world is people deeply care about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I feel like it's a not it's a not controversial thing. You're not going to talk to even the meanest meanest like, you know, just job of the hut motherfucker you come in and talk to is not going to say I hate music. I wish a kid didn't have music. They don't say that. They just say how you're going to pay for it. And if you can show them yeah, how. But, but, but they will say, and they have said, and they will continue to say, the government should not be in the business of funding the arts. Well, I think what's fascinating is that the arts are sort of a kind of shorthand for the values of a society. Yeah, right? yeah I mean, exactly. They, it's not just about you know, funding so that people can have a musical education or, you know, an artistic education. It's about like, what do you hold dear as a civilization, right? In fact, when we talk about civilization, the great civilizations of the past, we talk about two things, the buildings they left behind and the art they left behind, right? And so I I think it's, yeah, it's more than just about, you know, a certain kind of uh, politics or a certain kind of uh, you know, emphasis when it comes to education. It's about, you know, what does your civilization actually stand for, right? This is this is what we are going to leave. It's powerful. And there's also a good economic argument for it. I mean, uh, the, 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 the arts are a very, that's a lot of money moving. That moves yeah. a lot of money. And even yeah. small, like, you know, the, the, most politicians want to know that their sort of rural con- constituents out in the middle of nowhere are going to get something for these things. And if you show them, look, the NEA put a little money into this theater. They fixed an old historic theater up and they put some money to that. It was matched by seven times the amount of money in private funds, which is the the, the formula. So if you, if, you know, the, the NEA doesn't go into a place and just start spending commie ass money. What they do is they insist that that locally they're matched by seven dollars for their one in private investment. That place ends up flourishing. There's a coffee shop. There's a parking lot next to it. Pretty soon you've got yep. uh, you know you've got kung fu fighting across the street. Hey Rain, big news in shoes. Do tell. Rothy's. Rothy's is now selling men's sneakers and men's driving loafers. In fact, even more big news, they just launched premium merino wool shoes for the fall. Merino wool, for those of you who are uninitiated, is nature's perfect material. It's soft, comfortable, machine washable, and sustainable. And it's available in cool colors and classic styles that you'll want to wear everywhere. So if that wasn't enough, Rothy's just launched their first ever collection of accessories for men. They've got wallets, carry bags, card cases. Rothy's has all your everyday carry essentials. No more worrying about keeping your wallet clean after weeks of wear. Rothy's wallets are fully machine washable too. I really do like these sneakers. Uh, uh, It's a really cool hipstery design, the RS01 sneaker in crimson. Uh, They are fantastic. And uh, I am going to be getting a thousand pairs. Well, if there's one thing I know about you, it's that you are a hipster. So the these are the perfect sneakers for you. Anyway, to help you welcome fall season in style, Rothy's is doing something special. That's right. They're giving us the chance to share this super rare opportunity with our listeners for a limited time. Right now, you can get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash milkshake. That's rothys, R-O-T-H-Y-S, dot com slash milkshake. Head to rothys.com slash milkshake to find your new favorites today. You know, you may not know this uh, about us, but we have this podcast. You're actually on it right now. We are all about big questions. And so what we thought would be fun since, you know, it's not every day you get to have Ben Folds on your podcast is that we would have a special episode where instead of us kind of, you know, waxing philosophical Mm -hmm. about a particular subject, instead we would invite all our listeners, all dozens of our listeners uh, to call in with their questions. They're big life's questions. And, uh, and you know, we'll give you, we'll give you a little shot at, at trying to answer some of these. We'd love for you to, to be our third wheel today. You know, our, our co-host on this journey um, and dig into some life's big questions. So what do we got lined up, DJ? Hi, Reza and Rain. My name is Andrea Hope. And my life's big question is, how do you find the balance between pursuing your ego and pursuing your potential? 
So sometimes it can be really difficult when you're trying to make a decision to think, am I doing this to get attention or to get likes or follows or to put my name out there? But at the same time, you don't want to not do things that you have the potential to do because, you know, you could really positively influence other people. So especially being in media and the arts and everything, I was curious, yeah, how do you find that balance between being driven by your ego and being driven by your potential? This is right up your alley, Ben. That's ripe. Mm. Let's see. I would say that when I am trying, when I realize that what I'm trying to do uh, is too approval based, I feel a little sick and nervous. Talk about that a little bit more, Ben. I'm sorry, just because uh, you had mentioned this once before, and I want to make sure that Andrea c- uh, understands what you mean by approval based. Well, we're in a business where uh, it, it, it does need to, you know, the three of us could say we don't care, and and she who asked the question, we we don't care what anyone thinks. We don't need your approval. But at the end of the day, you start to realize you make more money, you have more friends, <laughs> life is better for you if people approve of it, and so it has to be taken into account somewhere. Uh, but I believe when that balance is 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 out, when what you're trying to do is 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 get votes uh, or get money or get clicks or likes, if you think this is is furthering uh, your career, no matter how you justify that, I find I will feel a certain kind of nervous. Uh, that's just me. I'll feel a little bit nervous if it's a way of singing, I might lose my voice. Like if I think, oh, people are gonna love it when I sing like this, yeah. <laughs> and then I'll lose my voice because mm-hmm. it's not me. And um, I think it's the nerves. And I think most people would recognize that like you've busted into a, a a candy store and you're getting ready to eat too much candy. Like there's something wrong with you. I totally relate to that. And as an actor, it is this perilous balance because your success is predicated on people liking you. So you walk out on stage right. or you walk in front of a camera and your film or your television show, you know, plays and people are either like, I'm entertained by you. And it isn't something you made. It isn't like, oh, here's this poem I wrote. Mm. And do you like these words on the page? It's you. It's your face. It's your voice. Yes, you're transforming into a character. But so there is in every actor, there is that narcissism of like, do you like me? I hope you like me. Sally Fields, like, you love me, don't you? You really do. Like that's underneath every actor. There is there is some kind of broken child energy in there. And at the same time, just like you say, if you do it for the approval seeking, you know, you're, you're doubting yourself, you're in your head, you're pandering Mm. to your worst qualities there. You can kind of smell the reek, the scent, the Mm. oily perspiration of like that, that wanting (laughs) need of, uh, of being liked and being loved. So Mm. you have to find that way in to, you know, honor that part of yourself that wants to be adored and at the same yeah. time uh, find your own path uh, to, um, to, to making it about the work. So always when yeah. I talk to young artists, it's like they'll talk about what should I do in my career and should I do this and should this. It's like if you just focus, on the, focus, on, the, focus on the work. Like what, is, what are yeah. you expressing? Yeah. What are the stories you want to tell? How do you want to tell them? What do you have that's special that no one else has? Like go, go with that. Go with that expression. I think yeah. for me, the, the, the ego uh, in, in all things, not just the arts, but the ego is, uh, is the enemy. You know, it's, mm-hmm. um, it's there for a very good reason. So we have to yeah. honor the ego. The ego has kept us alive, right? It, it, uh, it keeps me fed. It has kept humanity uh, thriving, shall we say, kind of thriving for 100,000 years. But at the same time, it presents incredible obstacles, you know, of self, uh, of a needy self-gratification at all times. So one balance that I have uh, to our fine caller is, for me, like social media is both super helpful and super evil and super Mm. toxic. So I've taken it off my phone. I don't have it on my fucking phone. I don't look at it. I don't read. If I spend time... If I have it on my phone, I'm reading the comments. And if I'm reading the comments, I'm on a roller coaster. I'm on an mm-hmm. up and a down of like, oh, they like that thought. Oh, this guy doesn't like me. Oh, they like that. Oh, they think that's not this person. Does. Uh, and I, my whole goal as a human being is to not be on the roller coaster, right? I mm, want to yeah, create hurts. my own, you know, 
rides at the amusement park uh, to stretch out that terrible metaphor. So I both use the pluses of social media that I broadcast what I'm doing and support yeah. friends and causes that I like, but I'm not caught up in that kind of like day to day, minute to minute, thumbs up, thumbs downness of the uh, toxic internet. And you probably feel if you were to just have a moment of weakness and put it on your phone or, or go through that stuff, you would probably feel that nervous feeling that I'm talking about. There's a, there's a heightened anxiety. I remember hearing a, a psychologist once say that just saying I, me, or my, talking about yourself is noticeable in vitals. When you're taking vital signs, you will see people's Blood pressure elevate slightly, pulse huh. elevate slightly, wow. and I think that's what you do. You, you're thinking about yourself. You're in your in your ego head, and it's actually not healthy. That was pretty great. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, next caller. Hi, Reza and Rain. This is Susie Meister. I wanted you to ask Ben Folds what he thinks it is about music that is so transcendent. We see the way that it can unite people in collective effervescence at uh, religious services and at concerts, and I want to know what he thinks it is about music that can create that effect. Great question, Susie. Music is communication. That's, that's the simple answer to it. It is nothing but communication. And it's communication that drops the guard of, uh, of, of the listener. If I want to get a point across, and I were to try to get that point across with statistics in a political speech, people put up great skepticism boundaries in front of them, and they fold their arms. Music unfolds the arms and mm. brings in something that's actually uh, human. Human beings have evolved with sound and ears into the brain. Music lights up the whole brain, and the reason that it does, if you go into a brain scan, while speech only lights up a small, two small places, one called the Broca's area, that's like the size of like a walnut. But music goes across the entire brain. The reason that is, I think probably from talking to anthropologists on my show, is that we depend on musical stories for survival. If you're laying in bed and you hear some thing sliding down the hallway and there's no one in your house, you're like, okay, what's sliding down the hallway? Does that sound drunk? Does that sound angry? You can tell if a sound that's, if someone's dragging trash can down the, down the uh, 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 alley behind your house, you can probably tell if they're angry, if they're drunk, if they're young, uh, which direction they're going, <laughs> what the thing is made out of, maybe what's in it. Mm -hmm. And that's an amazing amount of information, story information to be getting through your ears into your brain. I believe that music is, is the recent hijacking of all that incredible uh, 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 brain power to have fun, tell stories, make art, make people cry and laugh. And I think that it's just tied into the brain and that's, and we can't get away from it. And, and almost anyone who thinks that they are tone deaf will recognize songs. They'll recognize pitches, relative pitch. I could show you that they're hearing and recognizing a, you know, like a, a minor third. They hear that and, and uh, they can't tell you that's what it is, but they hear it. So I think that's what it is. That was Pretty fucking awesome. Thank you, Ben. Next. I uh, don't know what I want, like, the outcome of my life to be. Like, if I want to change something or, like, be remembered. I'm just kind of sitting on that right now. Okay. I will remember that. Yeah. I will not forget that. That's something you said that I'll remember. That's all. I, I can almost put that to music. Do it. You could, you could put that phrase to music? Put it to music. Well, let's listen to what he said one more, time, one more time and see what the key let's phrase is. I, uh don't know what I want, like the outcome of my life to be like, if I want to change something or like be remembered, I'm just kind of sitting on that right now. I don't know what I want my life to be. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I'd have to like look at the lyrics for a little while, but it seems like he wants to be major a little bit because he's kind of having fun with this. I think. Isn't there a sadness there though? There's kind of a. This. Yeah. That's the sad. That gives it a bitter sweet thing because instead of going to a typical major, normally you go one, you know. But I love that phrase. I don't know what I want the outcome of my life to be. And there's almost an iambic yeah. pentameter there, isn't there? Uh, yeah. The outcome of my life to be. Next up, we got Renee. My life's big question is, do you ever sit and wonder 
why we can lie. Not why do we lie, but what actually gives us the ability to speak something we know isn't true. Well, this is actually a really fascinating uh, question. And I do wonder uh, sometimes, uh, well, if we're talking about like evolutionarily speaking, there's actually a very interesting notion about why it is that human beings lie. Like what is the evolutionary reason for it? And I think the sort of prevailing theory is that lying helps to foster cooperation, right? That it's like if, you, if you're in a group, you know, in a cave or in a village or whatever, you can sort of foster closer bonds in your group if you can lie in order to manipulate people into cooperating, right? And in fact— <clears throat> I read somewhere that like the like the most cooperative uh, species, primates really, are the ones that are more the most adept at lying to each other. So it's weird to think that like lying began as a way to foster you know cooperation amongst a group. I read a similar thing about gossip. Yes, me too. Gossip uh, backbiting has actually helped build community and galvanize community. And it's evolutionarily speaking been very positively adaptive. I think both those things are true. You're trying to, you know, honestly win friends and influence and, and, and influence so you can galvanize people to cooperate and do things. There's a great book uh, 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 by uh, Professor uh, Jonathan Goshaw called "The Storytelling Animal," and it's about it's about just exactly that, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm sure it's a common theory, but the whole book is about that, and it's fascinating. And there's another one by um, uh, Augustine Fuentes, uh, uh, "The Creative Spark," about creativity and, and 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 human evolution, and so much of it is about food. And about stories, about just making up lies, telling people stuff that's not true. And he mentions gossiping. So I think those are all on it. Right, because what lying does is it like changes the function of your brain to start thinking about things that aren't real. And as those cognitive processes start to get more and more used to you sort of envisioning and communicating about unreal things, things that are not true, whatever, then you can see why that would then foster creativity eventually. And storytelling. Storytelling, and, exactly. And the, 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 storytelling is lying. You know, once upon a yep, time, yeah. there was a giant who lived on the hill and he <laughs> ate right, asparagus yeah. every morning for breakfast. That's a lie. It's also interesting, uh, you know, the, why I think she wonders too, maybe how you can even justify it or, or, or morally if there's not something inside you that thinks it's wrong. But if it's been working for the human species... Is it true that I think I've read that that there is a period of child development where you expect the child to lie for a while and that it's actually healthy? It's just that you kind of got to get them away from it. I think it should be said that there were a lot of uh, adaptive qualities that humanity has. You know, our you know violent reactivity has helped our species survive. You know, mm -hmm. but that at this phase in our evolution perhaps it's time to let some of that stuff go. And there might be another series of qualities that we need, you know, on a planetary wide, you know, global wide level to survive to the next level because the lying, the violence, the gossip, that those are three that we've mentioned. Those, yeah. those are three of the kind of the worst parts of what's happening, you know, globally and internationally and, and in the media right now. And it's not helping us anymore. So can we move away from those instincts that got us to this point? Again, honor them, but move yeah. on. Hello, this is Casey from Kansas City. My question is, which golden rule do you prefer? Do unto others as you would have done to yourself? Or do you prefer do not do to others what you would not want done to yourself? <laughs> that is all. Ah, they all double negative. You know, metaphysical milkshake listeners know that we've, Rain and I have talked about this on a few different episodes, that uh, when you look at so all the major religious traditions, not just living, but also the dead ones, those that have 
bother to put any kind of legal sort of, you know, uh, framework out there going all the way back to the Code of Hammurabi, for fuck's sake, have had some version of the golden rule. But what's fascinating is that most of those versions is the don't version that he's talking mm. about. Don't do something to, that you don't want happen that you don't want to not happen to you. And that was way too many negatives, but you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> don't not do what you wouldn't want someone else to not do unto you. I think the power in the negative is that it allows for the thought. So it's kind of like you may be capable of thinking of some really horrible thing to do, but the fact that you didn't do it is virtuous. I think that gives it a little edge. Yeah. Like I might want to steal all those books behind you, but I thought about it, but I'm not going to do it. As opposed to the positives, which is just assumes that someone is going to do those things. This is, again is another one of those kind of evolutionary answers, right? You kind of It kind of makes sense why this concept of the golden rule would arise in ancient civilizations in the negative form because it's a way of policing morality, right? Don't do bad things because you don't want bad things to happen to you. And then as we evolve and as we have more complex, you know, ideas of what morality is supposed to be, you kind of, you know, you positivize it, right? To do good to others because you want good to happen to you. Well, listen, Ben, this has been so much fun. Will you come back on the show sometime and be our third wheel again? Love to. Yes. Wait, I got an idea. Why don't why don't we do your podcast now? Oh my god. Everybody listening to this episode, switch on over to Lightning Bugs. That's right. With Ben Folds, and you're going to hear the end of this conversation and you're even going to get to listen to Rain and I help Ben uh, create a song from scratch, which is a new experience for Ben. But as fans of Metaphysical Milkshake know that I used to be a rock star, so it's totally a normal thing for me. Pike. Hey, listeners, as you know, we solicit questions on speakpipe.com slash metaphysical milkshake. Uh, you can also follow, like, rate, and if you review our pod on Apple Podcasts, in your little review, you can write your life's big question, and maybe we'll get in touch with you and bring you on the show. We love having fans, listeners, guests on the show, and today we are thrilled to have Ava uh, from somewhere in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a state I'm a little bit familiar with due to a television show that I did that shall remain nameless. And Ava looks like she's out in the woods, in the trees. Maybe she's in the middle of an M. Night Shyamalan movie right now. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, she does look a little bit haunted. But Ava, you're on the show. Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake. Thanks. My question was, how do we raise healthy children in this usually evil, capitalist, colonialist world that we live in? I have no idea. Thank you so much for calling in, Ava. <laughs> I think about that every day. Well, it's, I feel like it's a really important question because and sometimes you get these questions that don't have an answer, but mm -hmm. I feel like we got to figure out an answer for this one. There are some answers to this. There are some answers. And there's a couple of things that come to mind for me because this is a very important uh, question. Um, and it's for all parents, but it's really for all people because whatever we apply to the raising of kids, we can also use on ourselves. Um, I One of the things that brought me great joy as I was raising my son, Walter, who's now 17, was to be, um, whenever there were ads, whether it was on a billboard, a television commercial, a podcast, whatever, I taught him to have a critical mind about consumerism. Mm. Like, oh, Look at this ad that's on the TV. Oh, they want you to buy trucks. Why do you think they're running a truck ad during an NFL game? Oh, interesting, because of male audience. And then trucks uh, and masculinity are linked. Look at these men on this commercial. They're linking their sense of themselves with the actual truck that they buy and its hauling capacity, even though most of them will only be using it to commute back and forth uh, to the auto parts store where they work or what have you. Um, I don't mean to denigrate truck owners, uh, but nonetheless, I do think that raising kids to look at the capitalism around them 
um, and the consumerism around them with a kind of a keen critical eye is really important so that they have that perspective growing up. Don't just allow them to just buy in to, hey, more stuff makes us more happy. And, but to notice kind of society's kind of obsession with stuff. So that's, that's one thing that comes to mind. I have a few others, but Reza, what, what comes, to, what, what pops into your head? Well, look, my wife and I, you know, we, we actively um, pursue this um, idea with our kids. In fact, she's got an entire company now called Altruist, which is all about teaching kids empathy. Um, and I think that's the word. It, empathy is the word. I think so often, whether it's about teaching them about consumerism or, you know, colonialism or the, the evils of the world, if you can narrow it down to, I'm going to teach my kids h- how to empathize with other people, everything else I feel like kind of falls into place. So one thing that we do a lot in our, uh, is that on Sundays, uh, we have a dinner that we just sometimes refer to as like holy chow or whatever, where we talk about a particular issue. Um, and, you know, we got, kind of go around the table and, and we just kind of talk about what they think about the issue. Um, oftentimes, um, because my wife, you know, works with um, uh, people who are dealing with, you know, economic or, or social or political injustice. And so we will, for instance, if we're, if we're, Talking about refugees, you know, we'll say things like, um, hey, you know, we've moved before. Can you imagine if you were suddenly forced to move tomorrow and all you could bring with you is a backpack? Like, what would that be like? Um, And then we talk about how, well, you know, there are millions of people, mostly kids, who actually do experience that. They're called refugees. And just taking these very complex things around the world that, that you know, that they're sort of being bombarded with, you know, in media and, and stuff, and then figuring out how to connect their lives to it so that they have this modicum of empathy. So when we see homeless people, what we'll say is like, hey, what do you think would happen if you didn't have a home? It's not just that you'd be tired and you'd be, you know, cold or you'd be sick or you'd be dirty, but could you go to school? No, you couldn't even go to school, could you? Because you don't have, you know, clothes and you don't and you're and you're filthy. You know, what would it be like not to go to school? And then now every time they see homeless people, they they get it in a sort of visceral and emotional way. That's how kids understand. I think so often we we try to teach kids like rationally uh, or we try to, quote unquote, educate them, you know, about the the troubles of the world. There are these things called refugees, and this is what they are, and this is what happens. But that doesn't, it doesn't strike kids. Uh, it doesn't stay with them. But if you try to build empathy by making it part of their experience, at least I have found kid, my kids just absolutely burst over with kindness and compassion and empathy um, for people who are who are facing situations that are quite different than theirs. And that's kind of all we can do. One of the perspectives that I have is that, yes, in the current world, there are tremendous forces of disintegration. They're everywhere. They're forces of disunity, of judgment, of of vitriol, of hate. Um, And there are systems that are collapsing. There are systems that are just simply broken, like healthcare, let's say, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. There are also forces of integration. There are also you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, the Me Too movement. There are uh, various coalitions of people coming together to try and make the world a better place, you know, like Greta Thunberg and, um, you know, the the Fridays campaign of, of young people. So to always direct your children to see both clearly, oh, look, there's disintegration, but let's not focus on that. There's forces of integration and positivity. Yes. Let's work for that. Yes. Let's put their attention towards those things. Sometimes they may be harder to find than you'd like, but that's where your focus needs to be put. Because if you just spend all of your time looking at everything that's falling apart, you'll get overwhelmed and you'll never be able to accomplish anything. Ava, anything come to mind for you? Do you have kids? Is this just something you're worried about? I guess what wor- get worried about, uh, there's so much bad. And it's, 
important to know that not everything is great. You know, you want to raise kids who are going to see what's wrong and think, I don't like this. I'm going to figure out something else. But then you could, these kids get, there's the depression and the anxiety. You definitely can't just like lecture your 10 year old, you know? Yeah. But there's these times when we'll be in the car and we'll have these conversations between us. And they're so much more invested in like, what are the grownups talking about? And we can have like these heavy conversations in front of them and just hope that it's rubbing off a little. Do you and your partner uh, ever do acts of service, volunteer work? We really don't have the time for that right now. Well, even as something as as simple as planting a tree Mm -hmm. or um, collecting uh, foods, from your pantry and dropping them off at the at the food kitchen, just demonstrating through your actions your commitment to making the world a better place. Like kids will pick up on that, you know, long term over their lives. Ava, thank you so much for your call, and uh, it's really nice to see you. And that was a terrific question, yeah. and really one of the most important questions there is. So, listeners, do you have any thoughts? Uh, please share them with us. Um, at Rain Wilson, at Reza Aslan on the social medias. You can also connect with us at Meta Milk Podcast on Twitter and at Metaphysical Milkshake on Instagram. We would love to hear your life's questions and we'd love to hear your answers to this very important question from Ava. Ava, thanks for calling in. Thank you so much. Metaphysical Milkshake is executive produced by Rain Wilson, Reza Aslan, and Colin Thompson. It is produced by Safa Samazadeh Yazd, Harris Lane, Mick DeMaria, Hashem Self, and DJ Lubel. Cast Media is the production and distribution partner. It is edited by Tyler Newbold. Original music by Jeff Tang. Ben, I have an idea for your next musical venture, perhaps with a very, very, very large symphony. The Ben Folds Five. Hundred. Oh shit. We gotta find a stage big enough for my ego. Hey, thanks for watching, you guys. For more fantastic videos just like the one that you watch, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.